we're just waiting for the the uh, presenters to, to join us here in the room and then we'll get going Good morning. I now call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment to order. I'm Katrina Nockleby. I am the MLA for Great Slave and a member of this committee. Today we will receive a public briefing on the Yellowknife Airport Master Plan with the Minister of Infrastructure, the Honourable Diane Archie and her staff. Today's public meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. I would like to remind all members and presenters to direct all questions and comments to myself as chair and to wait to be recognized before speaking to help us have a smooth meeting. I will now ask members to introduce themselves for the record starting on my left. Thank you. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Caitlin Cleveland, Cam Lake. Alan Johnson, MLA, Friel and Eknor. And those members online? Jane Weyel and Armstrong, MLA for Moki. Ron Bonnetus, uh, Decho. Thank you, members. I welcome Minister Archie. Please introduce yourself and your staff and proceed with the presentation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So on request of the committee, we're here to provide an update on the status of the Yellowknife Airport Master Plan. With me today from Department of Infrastructure, I have Assistant Deputy Minister of Regional Operations, Mr. Gary Brennan and Mr. Randy Straker, manager for the Yellowknife Airport as witness, and Mr. Cameron Wilson, regional superintendent for North Slave as observer. Uh, thank you, please proceed with your presentation. So Madam Chair, the Department of Infrastructure is working with consultants to develop a 20 year master plan for the Yellowknife Airport taking into account flight and passenger traffic, airport infrastructure, commercial development, and the significant change brought by establishing the revolving fund in 2017. The 20-year master plan will help guide short, medium, and long-term planning in support of economic growth and sustainability of the Yellowknife Airport. 
As we recover from the impacts of COVID-19, the developments at the Young Life Airport will create new opportunities to grow the northern economy, create jobs, and attract businesses and visit visitors. Revenues generated at the airport will be invested in enhance enhancements to maintain a safe and secure airport, improve operational efficiencies, enhance customer service, and attract commercial growth and the development opportunities for all aviation-related business. These revenues will also help to upgrade the facilities focused on tourism and the growth needs of the resource sector. In today's update, we will discuss five alternatives that were proposed for the development of the airport, as well as stakeholder comments on the five scenarios. We will also provide a brief overview of the capital projects undertaken at the airport along with an update on aircraft and passenger movements. It's our department's priority to ensure the Yellowknife Airport Master Plan is developed to maximize economic benefits to the region and to the territory. Master planning is part of modernizing airport infrastructure in support of the 19th Legislative Assembly mandate commitment of making strategic infrastructure investments in order to connect communities, expand economy, or reduce cost of living. I will now ask um, Mr. Gary Brennan, Assistant Deputy Minister for Department of Infrastructure, to deliver a presentation on the Yellowknife Airport Master Plan. Following that, we will respond to any questions or comments the committee may have. Um, must see. Thank you, Minister Archie. Please go ahead, Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, I'm sort of new to this game, so I'm not quite sure who's controlling this here. Okay, perfect, yeah. thank you. Um, okay, um, so today we're going to just uh, provide, as the Minister mentioned, um, a brief overview of the master plan. We're going to do an overview of the Yellowknife Airport. We'll go through the five scenarios that were proposed, uh, take a review of the comments that we've heard so far, and then just look at some capital projects and, and some other uh, airport data there. So, next slide, please. And we can just skip over to the next slide, it just says an overview, and we'll go to the next slide again. Next. Um, and I do tend to speak fast, so if someone give me a cue, I start to go too fast. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, so the Yellowknife Airport. So we're a 24-7 certified airport, so we were able to be open 24 hours a day. Uh, two intersecting runways um, that allow us to, you know, land depending on the winds and those types of things. Uh, we have a Nav Canada Tower, which operates 24-7 uh, per day. Um, we also have a Category 6 aircraft, rescue and firefighting. And, and what that means basically is that we have to have two firefighters and two firefighting vehicles on, on site at all times that we're open. Uh, the airport is open 21 hours per day currently from 4 a.m. to 1 a.m. Uh, full service ATB. Uh, we have common use terminals in the building, which means that our carriers can, uh, you know, share, share um, counter space basically and, and just log in. Uh, we have cats uh, pre-board hold baggage screening and we have uh, in two inbound baggage belts which are screened as well. Um, and we have our own on-site airfield maintenance so we do our own uh, all maintenance of the airport runways and whatnot and those guys are on staff 21 hours per day uh, when the airport is open. Um, not mentioned in here, but we also have a combined service building, which our staff operate out of. So we have the airport terminal building, but we also have a combined service building. And that's a multi-bay garage where we have uh, firefighters, our airfield maintenance staff, and mechanics. Um, in 2017, as uh, members are aware, the Yellowknife Airport converted to a uh, revolving fund. And this revolving fund allows the airport to um, retain its revenues and it, revenues that we retain fund both the operations and capital investments. So the airport no longer has to uh, compete with uh, other departments for capital improvements. And we use the airport improvement fees to fund those capital improvements. Uh, the air terminal building itself was built originally in 1967. There has been a couple of modifications in 1998 uh, in, and another in 2005. And right now it's a uh, about 5,500 square meters, uh, two stories with a six-story six-story tower, um, and three main areas are the arrivals and departure area, the baggage screening building, and we have an annex trailer which has a departure gate and some offices. Um, 
As well, we are a site for cold weather testing. We've done various cold weather testing over the years, including most recently the Korea Aerospace Industry was here for a couple of months uh, and injected approximately $2 million into the economy, local economy. There's no significant benefit to the Olive Airport of having cold weather testing, except it brings, but it does bring business to the, to the city and to the territory. I think we got about 10,000 bucks out of this year, is my understanding, so that's the airport itself. Uh, and we do have some other opportunities in the future of, um, of in the, uh, businesses that have contacted either the airport or businesses in Yellowknife to potentially do future um, cold weather testing here as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we're completed to date. So in 2018, there was a master plan done by Stantec. Um, it was focused on two main areas, essentially the current existing site where the terminal building is and the west side development. And the west side is, would be near Dejo Boulevard for, in terms of a <clears throat> picture on the ground. Um, they talked about, you know, renovating our building, building a new building, and eventually potentially moving to the west side, and um, projected some pretty strong growth uh, numbers of 2.4% per year, which since COVID has happened, we understand that's no, no longer possible. Um, the EAC of the day reviewed the report and, and thought there were some things missing, basically, and they recommended uh, bringing in another contractor to do an economic analysis and look at some other growth opportunities on the airport site. So MXD was um, was hired, and they um, basically did another another plan, uh, including the economic analysis. And they looked at they came up with the five potential sites uh, for for growth, um, basically at the airport. And um, that report, I'm not quite sure if it was shared with the committee or not, but it basically you know, provided economic analysis. Uh, info. Um, then COVID happened, and you know the economic analysis went out the door, and uh, we decided that we would do another master plan to consolidate those two documents and do some uh, what we would like to consider meaningful engagement with the stakeholders. So we've we've done some engagement with uh, the various stakeholders at the airport, with industry, with indigenous groups, the city of Yellowknife, etc. And um, in approximately two weeks, there'll be a, a public uh, engagement as well. Um, that would be going live, I think, somewhere towards the middle of April. Um, so this proposed plan, which we'll be discussing here shortly, is uh, looking at the five different sites. And what we're here for today is to get feedback from the committee on, on how uh, what you guys' uh, comments are on the different sites uh, so we can come up with a, a final report uh, to go move forward, and, and the plan is going to guide us for the next 20 years. We want to grow responsibly. Uh, we want to work with our the city of Yellowknife, our indigenous partners, uh, so that we can uh, have an impact on the tourism, on the economic growth of the city of Yellowknife, and and the NWT in general. Next slide, please. Okay, so next we'll go into the the five scenarios. Um, so a little bit of a um, background on this. Uh, all five scenarios talk about uh, having the potential for a hotel, retail space, office, uh, some light industrial. Um, and, and these are concepts. Um, these would not be done by the GNWT or by the LNF Airport. These would be uh, completed if industry uh, is interested and there's a need identified. Uh, but they will show up in all of these different uh, scenarios. Um, so scenario one is essentially um, um, redeveloping the existing location. So right now we have a terminal building, uh, it's getting old, and beside there, uh, east of the terminal building, so towards, uh, I guess, old airport road, there is uh, some space that, that could be used to develop. It used to be, an old, an old, there's an old fire hall there now. Uh, scenario two is uh, redeveloping the north area. The north area is essentially the area along Bristol Avenue. Uh, this is where your Buffalo Air and other companies are currently located. Um, scenario three and four are very similar. They would be in the south area, so um, southeast, I guess, and that would be the area around the bottle shop across from uh, the sand pit area there. And scenario five would be the development of the west area. Uh, that's the area near Dejo Boulevard. 
Uh, so there's a range of options here, uh, you know, that we're looking at, including uh, additional cargo, logistics, spaces, and whatnot. Uh, and we'll go into each one of these uh, individually now and talk about the pros and cons of each. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so scenario one is again just re redeveloping the existing area. So the plan would be to re renovate the existing terminal building um, and the gates and aprons um, and redevelop the existing um, adjacent area. Again, this is the area east of the terminal building. Um, <clears throat> and we're looking at adding in again some retail, I think it's. Uh, Sorry, retail and um, industrial type uh, spaces there. Um, and the west area would be developed for future tenants uh, and logistics on, uh, on that side. Um, currently that land over there, the only building that we have is the uh, combined services building and we're hindered on the, uh, I guess the southern side of that by the uh, D&D's forward operating location as well. So all that area there could be developed. Um, and that equals about 50 plus uh, acres of unserviced lots right now. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so some of the strengths of this one is that we have a terminal building will be per perhaps the least expensive uh, option. Let's just go back one. Um, and, and the location is known, obviously, it's a recognized gateway right now, uh, and there's a critical mass of uh, aviation cargo activity near there, and that's the, uh, the current tenants that we have along uh, Bristol Avenue. Some of the challenges that we would face if we were to stay there are limited space and growth potential due to the location. We can't go in certain directions uh, right now, so it would be limited growth there. Um, it would end up creating a fragmented property pattern if we were to expand the west end. We would be all over the place, essentially. Um, the, the terminal building was built in 1967. Renovating the terminal building is, uh, is, is just extending the life of an old building. Um, not quite sure how long we would have left in that building. Um, and it doesn't allow for future airside commercial industrial lease lots in that area. They would have to move over to the west end. Um, next slide, please. So scenario two would be to uh, redevelop uh, the north area again. So this is the area along Bristol Avenue. Um, uh, so in this one here, we would uh, migrate the uh, existing tenants to the to the west end of the airport, uh, construct a new terminal building in the northeast corner towards uh, um, I guess towards King Lamp Board in that direction, um, and potentially put in water and, and sewer services. Currently, the Elnip Airport doesn't have water and sewer. It's trucked water and um, for potable water and non-potable water is brought up from, uh, actually from Frame, uh, Long Lake. Um, and then we would repurpose the uh, old uh, terminal building. So I think uh, in scenarios two through five, there is a, uh, the potential to um, repurpose the, the, ter the terminal building to some other, some other use. Um, and on the west end, what we would do is construct some construct roads uh, to support logistics and commercial development in that area, um, with no plans to uh, in put in water or sewer in that end, just due to the cost. Uh, next slide. So some of the strengths of uh, of this location, again, it's at the, uh, what we consider to be the gateway location, so the intersection of Highway 3 and Old Airport Road. Uh, there is that established critical mass along that area. Uh, it's a short distance to existing water lines and Old Airport Road. My understanding is that the current water lines go somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, Canadian Tire um, in that area, possibly as far as the traffic lights, but generally speaking, right there. Uh, and. Um, you know, so there's some potential commercial and industrial areas there. Uh, one of the main challenges would be on this one is that we have existing leases with tenants, and those tenants would have to, when those leases expire, we'd have to move them at significant cost to the tenants to move their operations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and in some cases, maybe some uh, environmental cleanup. Um, and then um, one of the other challenges that we would have, though, is that with a uh, terminal on one end and then business uh, over in the west end, is, is it's a significant distance inside the terminal to move cargo in other, other areas. And we may have to use the highway uh, to do that, because there wouldn't be a path from the west end to the east end. 
Um, scenario three, so next slide, please. So this will be redevelop redeveloping the area, a new terminal in the south area. Uh, scenario three and four are very similar, um, but basically we will put a new terminal uh, supported by various industries in the south area of the, of the uh, um, airport lands, and some of the other businesses would include uh, you know, limited retail, office, light industrial, flex business, air cargo, logistics. Uh, we've uh, I lined up a, a potential hotel on there as well, which could be developed if in the future there was a need. Uh, we would repurpose the existing terminal building for some other uses, and we would again construct a road on the west end for uh, airside cargo and uh, um, industrial development. Again, we would not install any water sewer on the west end. Um, Um, so in this one here, the, the strength of this one is, you know, the location. It's again on highway, adjacent to Highway 3, Old Airport Road, so a busy street. Uh, short distance to pipe services, we think it's about a kilometer, but I don't think we've ever really confirmed that. Um, you could reuse the existing terminal building, and uh, the new terminal then will be between the two existing runways and closer to the city, so it's a little bit uh, closer for people to get to. Um, Lots of space for growth and development, and there's an opportunity to cluster a lot of the uh, cargo logistics type uh, businesses, and the potential for industrial commercial users in the future as well as the economy starts to grow again. Um, some of the challenges we have in this one is uh, the land hasn't been um, a technical assessment hasn't been done on the land, so we, we, that would be required before we move ahead. Um, there will be increased traffic on Old Airport Road. Um, so not quite sure what that would mean to, in terms of the city. And also this area is actually pretty close to some residential areas as well. So the people on Magrum Drive probably wouldn't be entirely happy. The premier is right there. <laughs> you can be premier for long. <laughs> <laughs> um, scenario four, uh, a new terminal and gate retail gateway in South Area. So I think the only um, significant difference that I can see in this one and the previous one is that this one is proposing more retail uh, space up in the area. Uh, again, the, the benefits. Um, so we would, again, South Area, potential hotel, retail, logistics, and uh, an industrial area. And um, West Area would be the same. Uh, a little bit different road system, but essentially it's putting roads for uh, cargo and uh, other activities in the West End. No water sewer on the West End still. Uh, next slide, please. So the strengths are basically the same. Again, it is that the location is the shortest distance to water sewer, uh, places terminal building between the two runways and close to the city. Um, same same thing for growth and other things, and the, and the challenges would be the same as well. Uh, we just got to confirm that it's a developable area, developable area, and the traffic and, and proximity to residential areas. And the final scenario, scenario five. Um, the next slide would be the. Um, Moving everything to the west end. So in this case here, we would, uh, you know, create a create a system on the west end near Dacho Boulevard, whereby uh, we would construct a terminal, have uh, new spaces for tenants to move in. We have all our industrial cargo uh, and whatnot on that end. Um, no water and sewer uh, due to the cost, um, or we could do water and sewer, but a significant cost, I guess. Um, and the, again, the old airport terminal building could be repurposed for, for some use. Um, next slide, please. The strengths. Um, so this is already on an industrial truck route, so in terms of the commercial areas. Um, it does cluster a new uh, commercial industrial development with new terminal and airside cargo areas, so it's an opportunity to build a whole new area. Um, plenty of space over there, as previously mentioned. and. Uh, you know, so there's lots of opportunities for growth expansion for commercial logistics and, and other industrial development. Uh, another one of the challenges is that this area is currently undeveloped, and same thing, we'd have to do a geotech program over there to determine uh, the quality of the land. Uh, it's a long distance to existing water and sewer services, which would bump up the cost. Uh, it's long distance from the critical mass that exists along Bristol Avenue. It's um, not as close to town, not near uh, the gateway location. Um, 
And basically, yeah, so that's it, sure. So those are five scenarios. So next we'll move on to the comments that we've heard so far from our stakeholders. Um, so again, the stakeholders that we've engaged so far are the GNWT, the City of Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce, uh, airport tenants, airlines and carriers, tourism business groups, and indigenous groups. Um, those sessions were all held in March. So the general comments that we've heard so far is that um, Sorry, could we just move the slide? Thank you. Um, the Yellowknife Airport is a gateway to the north and huge economic driver for both the city and the NWT. Um, difficult to evaluate options without costs. Uh, how, will, how will the project be funded? Um, what about boarding bridges, counter spaces, parking, traffic flow, etc.? Um, I would consider those to be more operating things, but it's certainly good to hear people's concerns about those going forward. Um, Will there be a centralized facility for de-icing? Um, concerns about Yellowknife Airport competing with the city for businesses and, uh, and YKDFN for tenants. Um, concerns about a hotel at the airport because it doesn't bring travelers downtown. And uh, we also heard some other things like that security uh, is an issue at the airport and needs to be revisited. Uh, and if we're going to, to be developing, we should be looking at uh, involving the tenants in advance to see what can be built up front to support the tenants tenants and um, you know that as we welcome visitors back to after the pandemic is nice to do that in a better way that's currently being done at the airport um, I would comment on that that like we don't anticipate a new terminal building I'm hoping that we recover from the pandemic before that happens so <laughs> um, so specific comments that we heard in each scenario uh, next slide um, on scenario one the comments that we heard is um, Limited space for growth. Uh, it is least expensive. It's a potential cargo area far from the airport operations, which would increase costs to uh, cargo operators. Um, the re retrofitting option one would be the least disturbance to the airport, but there are limitations with uh, apron space. Um, and then with the limited space, uh, we're also limiting revenue generating opportunities as well. Uh, scenario two was a uh, very expensive option which take years to and will take years to relocate the tenants. Most of these leases are 20 year leases so potentially I don't know when they were last renewed but potentially 20 years would be a time frame there. Uh, concerns around waste management and overflow at the solid waste facility. If we're going to be decommissioning a bunch of buildings a lot of the waste would end up at the landfill. Uh, other says non-starter based on the investment the existing leaseholders have put into the properties. So if some of these properties have been occupied for you know decades, it would take a lot of money for them to uh, to move to move to a new site. And there's no good link between new terminal and tenant operations. And there's also a comment that developing the, the West End would obstruct rotor wing pathways for rotor wing operations. Um, next slide. Uh, scenarios three and four. Um, so it seems to be the most economic uh, development potential. Um, people like the access from Old Airport Road, but it may require a buffer separation from the uh, residential area nearby. Um, in terms of operations and taxi times, prefer to have cargo next to the terminal, and there's a, um, a link between the tenants and the terminal that would be easier. Um, and there's comments that there's good, seems to be a good layup, good, a good, uh, consolidation of all the potential uses at the airport. Um, scenario five for the west side terminal location is pretty far from current tenants. Uh, it's furthest away from the city, most expensive, and uh, the gateway access through an industrial area may not be desirable for visitors arriving to the airport, through the airport I should say, and it seemed to be unfavored due to the cost. Um, you know, if it's going to cost more to develop, then that's Costs get carried passed over to the uh, to the passengers. Um, yeah, there's concerns about the separation of activities from the current activities in uh, Long Bristol Avenue to the West End. And um, what else here? The proximity to D and D. Uh, what that would mean is unknown at status. So whether that would be good or bad for D and D. Would they need to improve their security if they have a lot more tenants over there? Um, not sure. And there is some comment that having it further away from residential areas is an improvement as well. Uh, 
so those are the comments today, and as previously noted, that we will be doing public consultations in April as well. Uh, so, uh, capital projects, aircraft, and passenger movements. So, so this is a quick summary of uh, some of the things that we've done since um, the revolving fund went in place. Uh, so again, the revolving fund went in 2017, and most of these projects started up in 2018. Uh, so, so far, we've been able to uh, afford the property itself. Is we've been able to do lighting upgrades on uh, on both runways. And so that was about six million dollars worth of work. Um, we're in the middle of a drainage improvement project. And uh, we've already done some terminal upgrades, including the common use terminals, uh, the lounge expansion, and uh, some inside improvements, such as uh, seating and uh, a paint job. And we're going to do an upgrade to our combined services building uh, this year to install more cameras and improve security of that building. Uh, in terms of a fleet, we've also uh, managed to do a significant fleet upgrade as well, getting rid of some of the older things and coming up with new equipment and better ways of doing things, more efficient. Uh, we've been able to get ACAP funding for two uh, fire trucks, basically, the aircraft rescue firefighting. Uh, one is noted here, which just came in in December and is uh, currently set to be going live in the spring after some training is done on that there. Um, and it just lists off some of the other uh, vehicles. Um, a lot of this was funded through the CAP program, and the ICE trailer, a multi-purpose tow vehicle, and a runway sweeper as well. Overall, we've invested about $24 million since 2018 in uh, the Illinois Airport capital projects. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the next slide talks about aircraft movements, and an aircraft movement is essentially any time a plane goes up or down on the, in, in, in the airport property, not in, and doesn't necessarily mean it goes through the airport terminal building, because we have uh, operators who have their own uh, areas over there. So we've definitely seen a significant decrease uh, with COVID in April 2020. The numbers went way down. If you can look at the charts there and try to distinguish between the colors, because I'm having trouble with my eyes these days. Um, but it, it, essentially, we did go down, and, and, and but a, a comparison year over year in 2019 uh, to 2020, we were down 30 uh, percent in terms of aircraft movements, and uh, currently down about 17 percent in, in terms of aircraft movements. Uh, one of the things that we did see was the air airline uh, operators started moving towards smaller planes, uh, which you'll see on the next slide when we look at the passenger movements. So, so 17 percent is. Uh, not too bad in terms of aircraft movements uh, as compared to a lot of the uh, airlines across Canada, airports across Canada. So, but when we look at the passenger movements, we can see that we're currently still down 62% from 2019 uh, pre-pandemic numbers. Um, and, and what happened basically is that the air operators started recognizing that there's less people, they started using smaller planes. Uh, so while the numbers of plane movements went up, the number of passengers are still way down. Um, on, on the positive side, I think for the last 10 months straight, we've seen increased numbers. Um, and with the most recent, uh, in a month or so ago, uh, of allow, allowing leisure travel, we're expecting the numbers to grow uh, significantly uh, this summer. And I do believe that both uh, WestJet and Air Canada are adding more flights, uh, maybe in May, uh, to support more people coming into the territory. So, and right now, being down 62%, I think some other airports are still down, like around 90% across the country. And finally, uh, next steps. The next slide, please. So the next steps is, is uh, you know, we need to undertake a technical review of the options that were listed here. Uh, so we talked about some sites that could be developed, and we need to figure out if they're actually developable. Um, online community engagement. That'll go live here in the next uh, 10 days or so. Uh, so that's going to be done uh, through a survey. It'll be on the GNWT engagement uh, portal as well. Um, then there'll be a draft uh, consolidated master plan prepared. So once we hear from the community and from the committee, then we'll put together the, the draft consolidated plan. Um, it'll be reviewed by the steering committee. It's come up with a finalized plan, which right now, where I'd like to say the end of April, but probably I think the middle of May will be more realistic uh, in terms of the final plan in place. So, um, and now, um, questions for the minister. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you for the presentation. Um, I believe that uh, Member uh, Johnson has a question to start. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start with some comments. Uh, my number one preference is whatever the preference of the existing airlines and tenants is. And I think an option where we're asking them to relocate infrastructure on 20-year leases uh, seems very untenable. You're essentially taking 10 million, tens of millions of dollars of assets and knowing that it'll eventually have to be removed and remediated and making it worthless and putting them in a very difficult position to invest in their buildings. Uh, I, I guess my second preference after whatever <laughs> the current tenants want is whatever is cheapest. I, I guess I'm just slightly confused what the problem is that we're trying to solve with you know these scenarios five of rebuilding some sort of new airport. A a and I, I would echo the concerns raised about I, I, we don't need a hotel at the airport. <laughs> Downtown is 10 minutes away. I don't believe we need retail spaces at the airport, but we have a downtown f with a bunch of vacant commercial space. I don't know why the GNWT would get into the business of competing with already, you know, a town that is struggling in that area. Uh, so I, I suspect that kind of is a somewhat of a strategy that comes out of airport plans from consultants because I mean, we get leasing money from that. I know that we make money off of our current airport leases, but it seems kind of a bizarre thing for me to me for government to enter into that space. I, I get leasing to airport tenants, obviously airlines need the space. But I, I guess I, I would welcome a little bit of insight about kind of the thoughts, you, you know, even some of the smaller plans include, you know, building cultural spaces or building retail or building commercial about why or how <laughs> that came in there or why would we would do that? Is it essentially just because we know there's some profit in it? It seems like a weird area that we would want to develop or that the GNWT would want to be a developer at all to me. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for that, uh, MLA Johnson. Uh, Minister? Thank you. Hold on. Back to oh, that one. I'm looking at the wrong one. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, those are all really good comments. And, you know, that's why the, um, the analysts and some of the reports were done to be able to look at all different scenarios. And I think just having some options and reaching out, looking at the pros and cons are another good um, um, way of just being open and honest about some of the options and the strengths and the challenges as well is important. Um, good comments and I, I welcome the members to participate in further surveys and further um, public engagement on some of the options and some of the, 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 the plans going forward given it is a 10 year um, plan and a lot can change in 10 years so I think that's important to note as well. Um, anyone want to add anything further? Yeah, go ahead. M Madam Chair, if I can. Yeah, please go ahead, Mr. Brennan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so, and, and um, I agree with the member's comments. It's, it's a difficult concept there, but, um, but one of the things in airports is we are at the mercy of uh, you know, the travelers and a lot of airports across the country and across the world have started going towards non-aeronautical revenues uh, to, to provide some stability. So, you know, the only airport is a revolving fund and it's business-like inside, inside of a government. And if there ever was a decision to move away from that, which I don't know if, if that's, that's a plan or not, like we would need to stabilize so that if, if there's another pandemic that the business could survive. So having, again, as you mentioned, uh, as the member mentioned, having uh, more non-aeronautical -aer revenues would stabilize, you know, the, basically the business of the airports out there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Uh, Emily Johnson, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think that perhaps gets into the larger conversation of whether the Yellowknife Airport should have ever gone to a revolving fund and whether there was a model where it was sustainable through passenger fees. Uh, I think likely it, any of these options are not going to be funded solely out of the revolving fund and probably requires some GWT money. Uh, I, I guess perhaps what is partially driving this is the age of, of, of the terminal and that you know even if we renovate it that we, we don't quite get to end of life. So I, I, I guess I would just 
welcome a bit more explanation. You know, if we get back to pre-pandemic levels and we see some steady growth over the next 20 years, are, are we essentially going to, you know, if we do nothing, let's say, and we have the current status quo, need to replace that terminal, or do we anticipate outgrowing it? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, uh, Emily Johnson. Uh, Madam, or, yeah, Madam Minister. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. You know, it's good questions. I mean, you know, we don't know what to anticipate in 10 years, and, um, you know, that's why we're doing some of the work to be able to address um, the airport situation going forward. Um, if I can, Madam Chair, if Gary can add anything further. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so um, I think pre-pandemic, we were, we were pretty close to outgrowing the, uh, the airport itself. Um, so, so if we were to return to pre-pandemic and if we see continued growth the way we were seeing it, because like in the last five years, you know, 2015, 2019, the growth of visitors was extremely high. Um, we would outgrow the airport. Um, and I guess with replacing versus rehabilitating an airport where we know there's no future growth, we have to decide as, as a government what's the most responsible thing to do. Uh, do we invest in a building that we know is 60 years old by then or 65 years old? Or do we look at rebuilding? And if we look at rebuilding, we know the current airport location is doesn't allow for further growth uh, and in fact right now I don't even think we can actually expand because of the requirements that are built around the airport we have to move some other infrastructure to even expand like, you know the, the parking lot is there the limited parking lot that we have we can't go that direction there's apron in the other direction so we are limited uh, there so so I, I think that um, you know you'll in answer the question yeah we would we would in a pre-pandemic world outgrow that airport uh, definitely and yeah, I think it's a responsible thing to do to look at other options for sure. Yeah. Next, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. I'm going to move on now to Member O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks for the uh, presentation. I guess I have a few comments, and I do have some questions as well. But um, uh, my background is, is is planning, so I understand the need to do land use plans. Um, but I don't think that's what the public wants. <laughs> I think what the public wants, as I understand it, is better customer experience when you go to the airport. They want bridges, they want less waiting time, maybe a little bit better quality food, uh, ni nicer seating, more space. That's what they want. And that's what people, you know, that's not what this delivers. And that's, what I think, what you guys have said in your general comments. I, I understand the needs for tenants and the people that you know have different uses of, for the airport, uh, but that's what the, the traveling public wants, and I don't think these plans really necessarily deliver on that. Uh, and I know as an MLA, I was around when the revolving fund was set up. I just want you guys to start spending money to improve the customer experience. Uh, the 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 the, the uh, revolving fund could just continues to grow. Uh, people continue to pay the airport improvement fees, and they don't see anything improving, um, even before the pandemic. So that's what I want you guys to address. I know this is not exactly the same as what's in the uh, the master plan, but uh, and if improving that experience requires a new terminal do it and do it in the cheapest possible location connected to existing services that's what I think in my humble opinion needs to be done um, now that I got that off my chest I think the other issue is uh, governance and accountability um, and this was raised during the um, you know the time that the revolving fund was set up you know uh, I'm not sure we're at the point where we need an independent airport authority, but we need something more than what we've got. And, uh, you know, f uh, having a revolving fund administered solely by the department, you know, the first uh, iteration of the advisory committee was appointed directly by the deputy minister and was basically an old boys club. We don't need that approach anymore. People, I think, want representation of different interests, more of a public interest perspective in terms of governance and accountability at, at the airport. 
Um, so that's a lot, Madam Chair. Why don't I just stop there? And then I do actually have some questions, but, um, and these are kind of tangential, I know, to what you're presenting to me today, but this is what I'm hearing from, from residents. And as somebody who has lived here since 1985 and can remember when the airport was about twice the size of this room, uh, uh, I know we've come a long way, but we got a long way that we need to go, especially if we're going to uh, try to improve uh, tourism and uh, the traveling experience for our public. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, Minister, would you like to respond? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'll just take on the second point of the Economic Advisory Committee. And I think the government did it right this time, perhaps, by putting a public advisory out. We had a list of um, good, good, diverse group of um, people put their name forward. And yeah, we're just reaching out to the Advisory Committee now to be able to get started on this piece of work, because it's very important to get everybody at the table and um, start to look at advancing some of this work. And if I can, Madam Chair, just in terms of some of the customer satisfactory in the airport, if I can, Mr. Straker. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Straker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as we moved into the revolving fund, there was a lot of things that, that uh, needed to be addressed early on. Um, certainly, we, we looked at things like um, uh, security wait lines, uh, processing of passengers, and we made some significant changes uh, with the increasing the size of the boarding lounge, reconfiguration of security to help enhance and speed that process up. Uh, we made some changes um, to the oversized baggage, which again uh, pushed it back into kind of the back end of the building, which freed up some space and again enhanced the process. Um, and then we did a fairly significant project with CATSA in upgrading the baggage system. Uh, we also did a sense of uh, place project um, with several partners, including the city, ITI, tourism, um, which saw kind of uh, creating a, a, an atmosphere that represented more of our region uh, and the region surrounding Yellowknife. Um, but the revolving fund has allowed us to do a whole lot more. Um, you know, when you look at a house, it's only as good as the foundation. And Yellowknife Airport, for a lot of years, um, like many other departments was competing for for capital dollars so things like runways uh, drainage uh, and even equipment was a battle every year to try and find ways to um, get some of these projects done so as a result you know the schools the hospitals were taking priority so we weren't allowed to or we weren't able to secure the funds required for those projects um, if you look at kind of a, a brief summary of the stuff that we have um, you know attacked over the past several years um, you know, the airport was built in 1967. I believe a lot of the lighting, uh, kind of the, the bones of the lighting, the, the cabling that was in the ground, uh, probably a lot of that has existed since 1967. Um, climate change has had an impact um, on our runways, movement of surfaces. Um, so an airport is only as good as the runways. You know, we can put all the comforts and everything into the terminal building, but if we can't fly aircraft or we can't land aircraft, um, you know, it, it doesn't do much for the public. So although a lot of the stuff that we've done in the past three years is really not up front and in the, in the public's eye, it has been critical to the success of the airport. Um, now, as we look forward, you know, our, our challenge now is how much do we invest in a building when we don't know what our future is? You know, where do we, where do we spend our dollars? Um, how much do we invest? Um, you know, you mentioned bridges has been a piece. Um, our arrival piece, when you get off the plane at 40 below, it's really uncomfortable. But we are located in our current uh, uh, location, very close to the runway. So we do have some regulatory um, restrictions on heights of items that go out of the building towards runway. Um, currently, we, we've had a lot of military activity. Uh, under new regulations now, we're having challenges of even parking those aircraft on our apron because of regulation. So these are the kind of things that that aren't so visual to the public or to people that don't regularly dabble in airports um, that kind of cons puts constraints on development or what we can or can't do. But, but yes, um, you know, as we move forward into the master plan and kind of have um, support and a vision within the government of what we want, um, then we can dig in and say, okay, this is what our long-term goal is. Here's where we can attack and, and maybe address more of these uh, um, kind of customer service type items. 
but they're going to be significant dollars, um, you know, depending where we are. Um, so planning and, and having an idea where our home is going to be in, you know, 10, 15, 20 years is going to dictate where we spend those dollars. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I just want to throw in a comment that it's good then that the runway is built on the only sand source around Yellowknife. So at least from a, a shifting perspective, it's not as bad as, as some of the loca locations around town. Member O'Reilly, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, yeah I, I acknowledge that there's been some recent improvements to the airport, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I also support my colleagues uh, from Yellowknife North uh, views on market disruption. I don't want us to be going into competition with hotels downtown or retail space downtown. I understand the need to have some retail space in the airport to meet travelers' needs, but uh, you know, let's keep the market disruption to a minimum. Um, I, I do have one specific question. I want to know what the, the cost of the studies are. So I think it's on slide five, if we can put that up. There's the, the first master plan, the market thingy, sorry, uh, and then the, the last master plan. Can you tell me what the cost of these three studies have been so far? Thanks, Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to answer. I'm not uh, super uh, experienced as the chair. My apologies, Madam Minister, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I was waiting for you to give some direction, but also a little bit of opportunity for Mr. Straker to be able to look at, to see if we have some of the numbers. And I understand there were two studies done, and you know, Stantec did the overall 20 year master plan. Yes, sir. And um, MDX, MXD Development Strategies did the market economic analysis. So there are two separate studies, and I believe I shared that with committee as well in confidence. Um, because it was a, a confidential document. And then we had uh, Dylan Consolidated come up with the master plan, some of the scenarios. The, um, the total contract value was $78,000. For Dylan, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment and ask that uh, Member O'Reilly was asking about the cost of the other two studies. Can you provide that, please? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I can, the the cost of the let me just get my glasses on because they're pretty. There's quite a bit of costs on there. So the um, the cost of the master plan. Actually, you know what? I'm not good. I'm going to ask Mr. Straker to be able to use his better eyes and get it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Minister. His glasses must be stronger than yours. Go ahead, Mr. Straker. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the cost of the initial Stantec uh, mass plan uh, started in 2018, completed 2019, was 217900 uh, And then the following uh, year in 2019, uh, we had MXD come on board and, and complete uh, the uh, addition to the master plan, uh, and it came in at uh, just under 100000 99900 And then, uh, as already mentioned, the uh, current contract with Dylan, I think, was uh, originally awarded at seventy. I think we're at 78000 right now on that uh, project. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move on to MLA Cleveland for the next question. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate um, Mr. Straker's comments around an airport is only as good as its runways. And um, in conjunction with that, my colleague from Yellowknife North stating that, you know, go and ask the, the air carriers what they want. And so I, I, I agree with talking to air carriers about what works on the runway side of an airport and especially where pilots get to decide where they want to land and where they don't want to land and so making sure we have somewhere where people will actually land I think is 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 key um, but I don't agree with with putting this in the hands of of carriers especially where half the carriers who have kiosks out there don't have a vested interest in the north I don't agree with Air Canada and WestJet making economic decisions for the Northwest Territories and so um, my question there is more around you know I don't think this is a situation of if you build it they will come I think that having an idea of what the plan is for the Northwest Territories is a, is a good place to start. And with that, my question would be, 
Is there a plan to start inviting international carriers to land in Yellowknife and or in the Northwest Territories? Are we actually going to become an international airport? And I think that knowing what our future holds is a key part of knowing what we need as far as space out at the airport. Thank you. Thank you for that, MLA Cleveland. Uh, Madam Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, that's a really good question in terms of um, looking at the plans going forward and whether we invite international travel to Young Life. Um, if I can, maybe just ask Mr. Brennan to speak a little further about what our plans are going forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, yeah, uh, please go ahead and just being conscious of time and, and such. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so um, with respect to international travel, currently one of our hindrances with international travel, two hindrances I'm aware of is number one is that we don't have a Canadian Border Security Agency in Yellowknife, and number two is that our terminal uh, is not set up for international travel. We don't have the proper screening set up there, so it's uh, quite a lot of administration right now to invite, uh, to have planes land here. Uh, we basically can't allow anyone else in certain areas of the airport right now. Um, we are not currently working on uh, plans to invite uh, others, although in the past we've had some discussions through tourism in the BTA with some uh, other jurisdictions. Um, I'm not quite sure where they are, but uh, certainly in a post-pandemic world, that would be a good discussion to have with uh, tourism again to see what we can do. So thank you for the comment. Thank you for that. I also want to throw my <laughs> support behind the international community and that discussion around cold weather testing as well. Uh, go ahead, Emily Cleveland. Yeah, thank you very much for that, and thank you for that addition to, to the chair as well. Um, and, and the reason that I think that this is such a, uh, an important piece of that is that really then our terminal and the activity in our terminal is restrained by the size of the aircrafts that are coming into the north. And so right now we do have a couple of Boeings that travel from Yellowknife to uh, Norman Wells on to Inuvik um, through Canadian North, but a lot of the tourists are traveling on um, RJs or ATRs coming up through um, WestJet and Air Canada and so you, typically you're looking at 42 or 72 people coming into the territory roughly um, per aircraft and so our, our needs as far as our terminal are restricted by well as far as tourism is concerned as far as the aircraft that are actually landing here and so um, I, I just wanted to point that out because I think that then that lends well more to um, Emily O'Reilly's comments about the importance of customer experience um, for when people are in a terminal that suits the size of our needs. Um, and, and in addition to that, I think it would be valuable when talking to the public for them to understand what each terminal or each option means as far as customer experience and economic potential of the Northwest Territories. So for example, you know, if option X equals greater potential for military activity in the Northwest Territories, or if option X means uh, bridges, for example, to airplanes, that is what is going to make a huge difference to people when they're talking uh, to the Department of Infrastructure. And I think paired with that, if people understand that, you know, option X, which has a hotel, means a hundred dollars difference, for example, to their flights in and out of um, Yellowknife to Inuvik, for example, um, or when people are traveling within the territory or even out of the territory, what that cost difference is going to mean as far as being able to pay for that customer experience, somebody might decide that they would much rather put on a coat than pay an extra hundred dollars. And so I think that understanding how much each of the costs are and what that cost increase would be for the customer experience would be a key part of this. And so I guess my question then, sorry for the long-winded question, Madam Chair, but is the cost increase, um, or sorry, is the cost associated with each option going to be released and the anticipated uh, difference in fee, airport fees and taxes going to be communicated to the public to help them make the decisions on what they value as far as customer experience and uh, economic potential and cost to residents. Thank you. Thank you, MLA Cleveland. I think a lot of good points in there, uh, Madam Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, absolutely, a lot of good comments and good questions because, I mean, the whole purpose of doing some of the engagement here is to be able to get more information, get um, 
uh, further information from any of the passengers, any of the customers that are going through Yell Night, perhaps, and be able to look at um, what are some of the costs. And I, I believe that's part of the work because it's, you know, once we have different scenarios and costs, I think that would kind of pave a way for a path going forward. But if I can, Madam Chair, just quickly ask Mr. Brennan to speak further about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Brennan. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and yeah, yes, lots of really good points there. Um, and I think in terms of the impacts on the, uh, on the I think the question was, uh, you know, what are the impacts on what our customer going to be paying every hand and off. Uh, uh, the idea of the a airport improvement fee uh, that went in place with the revolving fund in 2017 was that we would collect that airport uh, improvement fee and that would pay for the capital upgrades that we're planning. Um, obviously, like any fee over time, I'm sure the airport improvement fee would increase. It hasn't to date. Uh, but the idea of the capital developments that we're proposing is to not hand those fees over to passengers. That's the idea. Um, a terminal building would be solely, not solely, 95% dependent on federal funding at the end of the day. We, we don't generate enough money, uh, we will never generate enough money through the airport and broom feed pay for, uh, um, a, in my opinion, and I do have a finance background, um, my, I don't think we'll ever generate enough money to pay for a terminal building ourselves. Uh, so we would still be seeking federal funding, but the idea would be that the airport improvement fee would be used for financing of the gene of portion of that there. So we try not to pass down any capital cost to the air passengers via the, obviously that goes to the air carriers first, right? So then there's administration fees built on top of that as well, right? So ideally this would not cost anything more. Something like bridges and those types of things, you started getting into more into operations, potentially that could be bad. Pass on to the carriers, though, right? Through use, so you've seen it. Uh, airports usually charge a fee to use bridges. Then that gets passed to the carrier. That could get passed down. So, but we can look at all. Start looking at those types of things. Always. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just, if my colleagues are fine, going to jump in with a couple of questions. I've agreed with a lot of, of their comments here. Um, I'm quite concerned about coming out into an engagement situation where you have five very vastly different scenarios and yet, um, and they could be wildly different in uh, costing and all of that. But I'm going to go back to my roots here and I'm going to look at some of your scenarios around uh, expansion and into those, the lands that you're looking at. Um, go, Given what I kind of know about, about this area, I, I'm, I think the key piece here missing before engagement is the cost of the geotechnical because I think that when you start to explore looking at expanding uh, into those areas, um, you know, some of these scenarios may just rule themselves out because the land isn't suitable for use, um, you know, and I think uh, you've made the point about the one scenario being very close to uh, residential, so that could just be a, a, a no-brainer or, sorry, a dead end right to start. So I guess my question is, I, or my, my point uh, I'd like to hear from the department about is that some of these scenarios may just rule themselves out, and I'm worried if you're going to spend time and energy and costing and engaging on scenarios that in the end aren't going to work because, yes, we could build anywhere we want, uh, but just like Sissons, are we going to build it in the swamp or are we going to build it back on the rock because things always kind of go sideways in project management in the north so I, I think that's a real key piece that needs to be developed before you're taking that out to engagement so uh, I'll leave it at that and maybe the minister can speak to her thoughts on that thank you uh, thank you madam chair really good really good comments I think that's important that you know we bring this out in the public now to be able to have a look at you know, what it is we want to achieve from this master plan. What are some of the options? What are some of the costs? I mean, you bring up some of the scenarios, and some of the scenarios have big challenges, right? And then costs associated with that also is, uh, is incorporated as part of the bigger picture, costs in different scenarios. And maybe you're right. Maybe once we do the public engagement, start the advisory committee work, and they come back and say, we're, we're now down to two as a result of that. I mean... Mr. Bren mentioned that we have to go to the feds for federal funding and perhaps maybe GNWT, we're not sure, but that is something that we need to look, that's my thoughts on it. We need to look at the costs in all the scenarios, whether we stick with five or we come down to two or three. So the, that's my thoughts, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. And I guess where I'm going with this is trying to avoid headache, uh, you know, in, in starting down the paths on some of these that are, like I said, are going to flush themselves out, really. Um, I guess another piece of it is we talked about revenues and the, the need to diversify from just the aeronautical uh, focused leases to sort of a retail lease, and that gives us more stability. Um, I think the third piece of that that's not being talked about is the cold weather's testing, because that's a lucrative piece that's very little uh, from an investment part on our our side uh, rather than just you know uh, maybe more security and more staffing at the at the airport itself plus it brings in people in a, that are going to come back as tourists etc all of that so to me I, I'm concerned that none of these really have a specified like cold weather area and I'm not sure if that's something that actually would need to be sort of its own entity within the airport but that's sort of one piece, but I guess where I'm going is one of the things I heard often as a minister was the lack of leases, available leases to people around the airport. And so I guess where I would like to see better, and I'm thinking you almost need to start doing a table type uh, comparison where you have the lists of all of the things that each scenario may encompass and then have the X's that just say, yes, scenario one has X, Y, and Z, scenario two has that, and then it's very basic and people can look at it. Um, for me, I would be pushing to support any option that would increase the amount of aeronautical leases at the airport because I have had people approach saying that it's impossible to get one of those. Um, I do not support relocating existing leases. I think you are going to run into a huge uh, uh, backlash from uh, the existing occupants, not to mention the amount of environmental and site assessment that will need to be done to, to transfer those those leases back to the territory and get those people off. You won't have those people out. I can think of one right now. You have a Petro-Canada contaminated site on Bristol Avenue. You are not going to be able to build on that site. So right there, you, your scenario of, of moving leases is gone. So unless you're going to wait 10 years for more remediation to happen and the lawsuit that's happening right now between Buffalo and Petro-Canada as far as I'm aware. So these are the things that I think that this hasn't been fulsomely in some ways thought out and I think if you go to engagement now you're going to have a problem. Public engagement anyway, I do think you should be talking to the technical people, the engineers, the, the leaseholders, etc. But if you start going to the public with these scenarios you're just going to have so much information to deal with that you will not be able to move forward and people will get mad. Thank you, Madam Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Really good comments. I mean, I'll take that as a comment. I mean, we have enough, you know, staff around the table and people listening on the call as well to be able to hear some concerns. And also just some of the, um, the public engagement and feedback is so important. Yes, I get we're going to have a lot of, you know, input into some of the, the direction going forward on the, the master plan. So I'll take that as a comment, Madam Chair. Thank you, and, and maybe just to throw one last thing in, because I am the chair, um, that uh, maybe I'm not saying get rid of the public engagement, but maybe take it up uh, a higher level around what my, uh, Member O'Reilly was saying around the comforts of the of the air sp of the air terminal building, etc., versus coming to them with five scenarios like this at this stage. I think you need to narrow this down before you take that part to public engagement. So that's more of a comment. Did you want to respond, Madam Chief Minister? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, that's a good comment. And I think that gives us some direction going forward. And, you know, as we start to look at the Economic Committee to have um, some input in as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I can guarantee you that this committee will continue to engage you on this topic going forward as it is really a hot button topic for us and I think the territory. So I'm just going to look at my colleagues, my, mindful of time, if anybody does have one more question or so. Yeah, Member O'Reilly, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. So I think I heard during the presentation that there's some kind of a steering committee that's... Um, <laughs> sorry, <you've coughs> sorry, you folks are working with, <clears throat> with regard to this master plan. Can you tell me who sits on it and um, what their role really is? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Go ahead, Madam Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So the Economic Advisory Committee mm -hmm. is providing strategic advice to the airport management team. So in October 2021, we put a public call for nominations for members to this committee. So the following members were selected based on their proven entrepreneurial success, expertise in the business strategy, uh, analytics, market tourism, information technology, 
years of experience. So the committee is based on, uh, the committee consists of Kathy Bolstead, Jen Hayward, John Henderson, Kelly Kahlo, Caroline Pollock, Tim Sear, and Peter Vican. We also have a project steering committee, which is the deputy ministers, two assistant deputy ministers, and regional, regional superintendent. Cameron. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I was frantically trying to write, and then I'm like, I can go back and listen to it later. Um, I just have a question there. Was any of those people an engineer? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Mr. Brennan, go ahead. Uh, sorry, which group do you mean are you referring to? Madam Chair? The steering committee. I'm sorry, it went really fast, so it was hard. The group with Kathy Bolstead, etc. cetera. The advisory committee, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Brennan. Are any of them engineers or technical people? Uh, my understanding is that on the economic advisory committee that there's two engineers uh, and one engineer on the steering committee. Thank you. I've always got to get a plug in for my, my peers there. So uh, that makes gives me some reassurance. Um, Mr. O'Reilly, did you have a follow-up to that? Uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, if I wasn't confused before. Okay, um, I wasn't even asking about the advisory committee. I was asking about the project steering committee. So it sounds like it's just internal to uh, infrastructure. And I see nodding heads. Um, so then what is the role of the Economic Advisory Committee in the Master Plan? Are you guys talking to them or what? Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly, and I'm probably the reason I created some of that confusion. So my apologies there. Uh, Madam Minister, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So the role of the Economic Advisory Committee is to provide advice to the LNAF um, Airport for business related activities, including implementation of this 20 year master plan. So, the Economic Advisory Committee will guide the airport through its future infrastructure development, which will support um, engagement, develop relationships with industry and indigenous partners, also, aviation industry as we recover from the COVID impacts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Minister. Uh, not seeing anyone else, and if there is questions, they can follow up with you uh, offline. I wanted to thank you and your staff for being here today. Uh, it was very informative, and I, I know that we will have a lively discussion uh, afterwards about uh, where we're going to go next and our, our response back to you. So thank you so much. And this does conclude the uh, public portion of our meeting, and we will be going back in camera. Thank you.